So my talk's called Kubernetes Secur Security Low-Hanging Fruit. Uh, this container camp number 10, historic occasion. So yes, my name's Luke Bond. I'm uh, more from a developer background rather than an ops background. I'm one of the co-founders of a Kubernetes security consultancy in London called Control Plane. Um, so I've gone from a developer background to more into a dev and ops and security kind of, uh, kind of angle. So what, I'm going, what I want to sort of drive home today, I guess, is that I know that security can often be daunting for many people. Um, I believe that it shouldn't, and I think it's part because of the way it's explained and the way it's presented. Um, often we go into, as a, as a consultancy, we go into places and they're like, they don't know where to start. Okay, it's good for us, I guess, but um, what I want to do is make sure that you can take away from this a few basic things that are a good place to start. Uh, Praveen had a good um, lightness talk earlier where he covered a lot of the best practices, drawing from a few other talks, um, and a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of similar kind of stuff. So what I want to make sure is that you Rather than being daunted and not knowing where to start and just being told there are all these things that you can configure, I will do that a little bit, but then afterwards I will then show, actually, if you start here and just do these few basic things, then you've already covered like a lot of, a lot of stuff and you'll be in a good position. So first I'll do some background about container security and then a bit of background about how attacks on Kubernetes might progress if you get a workload that's attacked, what might happen, and uh, that will sort of give you an idea of why I'm suggesting you do these kind of defenses. And then the various defenses you can make uh, and some recommendations. I'm going to wind up with, um, finish up with some suggestions on how to take, make security more of a part of your organization culture, which I think will uh, sort of start to address this stuff going forward. So a bit of a background. Um, containers are just processes. If you've ever learned, like, like, like me, when I learned containers years ago, it was uh, told to me that containers are Lightweight VMs, did anyone get told that when they first came across it? Yeah, um, some, I think by now maybe people understand that's not the case, but many people are still surprised to hear a container is just a process, just a Linux process. You do PS in your system, you see them all there. Um, with containers, we make an isolation trade-off compared to using VMs. Um, so this is sort of a uh, comparison of what your stack might look like if you're running on a hypervisor with VMs with each of your applications in their own virtual machine. Obviously, the big difference is that we have a guest OS Per, um, per application on, on the left-hand side. And but on the right-hand side, we're sharing a kernel and we've got processes directly on the host. We do have some isolation, but less isolation than with hypervisor. That, that trade-off is about scale and speed, um, among other things, but we do have some reduced isolation. But that level of isolation is fine, as long as you understand it, and it basically means don't do multi-tenancy. Asterisk, because you can do it, but it's beyond the scope this talk. Okay, so what are the um, isolation boundaries between the different components of Kubernetes? Um, we have, as we know, a pod is made up of one or more containers. Each container within a pod will have its own mount and PID namespace. That asterisk there is because they recently changed the beta feature, introduced, introduced the beta feature, which is on by default, which I find a bit bizarre. That may, means that as of, I think it's 115, PID namespaces are shared. Talk about that later if anyone wants to talk about it. I've got some rants. Um, so that means essentially that containers can't see each other's files when they're in the same um, when they're in the same pod. It also means that if you do PS in a container, you can't see except that asterisk thing. It means you can't see what's uh, which processes are running in the other containers in a pod. That's because they share mount and mount and pid names. Mount names have say, they have their own mount and pid namespaces. Pods have their own network namespaces. So that means they basically have their share a network adapter. It means they share an IP address. They share the exact same interface. It means they can't contain multiple containers can't bind to the same port. They'll talk to each other on local host. It's the same interface. Um, then outside that boundary, we have the node. On the node, we have the runtime, which I, by which I mean container runtime, generally Docker, and the kubelet, and the Linux host itself. So. You can already start to see that if a workload is compromised, i.e. a container is broken into, then you have some isolation, and if you break out of that, you will reach the node. If you break out of that, you might be able to reach the, the control plane. That's kind of how we're going to see that attacks might progress. So the control plane, I've put here as one box. I don't mean to say it's one master, but we have in there, relevant to this discussion at least, is the API and etcd, Kubernetes API, where if you can access it, you might be able to fetch secrets, you might be able to control the cluster, in both cases subject to RBAC. With etcd, if you're able to reach etcd, then secrets should be encrypted. 
but you may have that key too, who knows. Um, but if you can write to ATB, you've got pretty much a complete cluster control bypassing RVAC. So these are our isolation boundaries in the Kubernetes cluster. So before I say about what an attack, how an attack might progress, um, just a bit of terminology. So I've already, I've already used some of these terms. So vulnerability is some weakness, whether it be a design flaw or a bug, or um, some, some, something poorly you know, designed for a bug, um, that can be exploited in an attack. So an attack is when someone is actually breaking in, when someone's trying to break or break into some sort of system by exploiting a vulnerability to gain entry there. Compromise is when, the, when a component is attacked by exploiting a vulnerability and you gain control over that, then that component is compromised. Uh, foothold is the first entry point where an attacker will break into a cluster. They might then, that's the first place they get in from which they'll try to pivot to other places to see what other services they can talk to, see if they can break out of that boundary and, start, and reach uh, other domains or other, other parts of the system. And privilege escalation, just like when you do sudo, you go from having one level of privileges to having more. Um, that's something that an attacker will want to do when they break in. They're like, hopefully not like root on a host, but they'll try to be, right? They'll try to escalate privilege. Okay, so how would an attack proceed in the case of a workload compromise? So this is when someone's actually broken into, you've got some application that's on the internet running in a container, in a pod, on a host, in a cluster. That, that workload is compromised. So that will happen via an application vulnerability being exploited. So this might be, if you've ever heard of the Equifax leak, which is a, a great one for me to use many examples. Um, that was explo exploitation of a struts vulnerability that ultimately allowed them to um, control that workload in some way. So for example, might, the attacker's going to want to try to gain, for example, shell access inside a container. At this point, they're in a mount namespace, remember. They're able to see only what's in that mount namespace, assuming all things are configured sanely. From there, they're going to want to discover other workloads that they can talk to. So hopefully, I mean hopefully from the point of view of attacker, <laughs> hopefully they will find some other microservice that has some sensitive data that they're going to want to try to query. Let's say like maybe a database that they can just reach with that, obviously, it's gonna be credentials. You're gonna need some privilege escalation, but let's keep it simple here. So um, they will want to, yes, talk to other services, and then if they're able to get hold of some data from that service, they'd like to exfiltrate it, so send it off across the internet. Um, they might, from there, want to pivot to break out into the container, get onto the host via some container breakout, or maybe the container they're running is privileged. Breaking out of that is much easier. It may be exploiting system calls, kernel break. This is not really the stuff that needs to keep us up at night as such. It's not the low-hanging fruit thing to worry about, but this might be something they might choose to do. They might also, well, they, they will certainly, if they know Kubernetes, look for a service account token in that workload and then see what they can do with that. I'll talk about that in a moment. Well, I'll talk about, about that on this slide. Okay, so that's the workload compromise. What about compromising the cluster itself? Um, let's imagine they have access to a host already. What are they going to try to do? They're going to try to use the container runtime, like Docker or whatever, if that's what's being used in the host, to run containers, hopefully privileged containers, being able to run, having access to a Docker socket and being able to run um, Containers as root is like even better than having root on a host because that you will never know what they did. That user never logged in, right? Um, given a service account token that they got from workload in the previous slide, they're going to want to access the Kubernetes API, use something like kube control auth can I and say, can I get secrets? Can I get pods? Can I create pods? God forbid, maybe it's even cluster admin workloads. I mean, it's a pretty contrived example if that were the case, we'd be in big trouble. Um, they may also, because they're on a host, on that host is a, not only the container runtime, but also the kubelet. They would like to try to find the credentials that that kubelet uses to talk to the API. If that's on disk somewhere, that would be useful because then they can do whatever the kubelet can do with the API, which is get secrets. Hopefully secrets only for the workloads on this node, but let's gloss over those details. It's not a good thing for an attacker to get hold of for us. Um, maybe they'd like to attack the Kubernetes API there have been vulnerabilities in that before. There presumably will be again, possibly even are right now, who knows. They will also maybe try to get to access that CD for all the reasons I said before. So there are a bunch of things we can do to configure, to secure various aspects of our cluster and our workloads. Um, I've broken them up into this longish list of categories. I'm gonna kind of whiz through them. Um, 
I didn't make a note of what time I started. Okay, cool. So I'm about 30 minutes in. Um, I'll sort of whiz through them. This is the area, this is kind of like background stuff. And then after that, I'll pick out from those what I think is a low, low hanging fruit that I think you should focus on. So um, supply chain, container image, application, pipeline controls. Well, we'll go through them all. Okay, supply chain. So supply chain in software is all of our code and all of our code's dependencies and all of our operating system dependencies, everything that goes into our Docker file um, and uh, is all part of our supply chain, our software supply chain. Um, various things we can do in that category to help is to ensure the provenance and veracity of downloaded artifacts, i.e. where they come from and have they been messed with. We might choose to whitelist the source of dependencies, like you can only download things from a certain um, mirror or something like that. Um, we might choose to whitelist uh, individual vetted dependencies. For example, might allow NPM usage, but a, a whitelist of package names might be overly restrictive for, for developers. That's, that's, that's for you to decide, but these are just things that you could do. Um, we'd want to, use, in, with all the dependencies that we have in our supply chain, we'd want to know what vulnerabilities are in there and either not use things that have vulnerabilities or patch them or work around them, something like that. And get branch protection and commit signing. Uh, a lot of our code is coming from Git, whether it be in our projects, in our organization, or from projects um, in, in, in like open source projects. We want to make sure that code that's going into our application is committed by the person who claims to be committing it. That's what commit signing is for. You can easily fake commits. Um, Git Merkle tree structure is about integrity, not about authorization. Um, and Git branch protection, so that we can ensure that people aren't forcing commits to cover their tracks or um, not having sufficient scrutiny on maybe, maybe a change to a pipe for a Jenkins file, for example, that might want to get some secrets out. So these are, pipe, these are supply chain things. In the container image, this has been mentioned a few times already, it's very important, minimizing the attack surface. As you saw in that workflow of, in that, in that flow of what would happen when a workload is compromised, they're, in, they're isolated by the mount namespace initially. They can't see other containers, files, they can't see the files on the host. But you want to make sure that the tools that are in that image, ideally there's nothing in there but your application, um, as uh, Scott was saying earlier. Um, and ideally there's nothing in there, but uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so you want to keep that small to minimize the attack surface. We could, you'd want to be, able, want to be whitelisted, we presumably would want to whitelist based images. In an organization you might say people can use um, People can use this set of base images but not others. Maybe force them to only be at least Docker, uh, Docker official ones. Something like that. You need, it's a policy-based thing that you need to figure out. Um, scan your images for vulnerabilities. This is probably not a surprise to hear. But we want to know what we're running and what vulnerabilities are in them so that we can patch them quickly. Image signing is there to ensure that the images that we build and test and scan and push to our registry are the same ones that we run. We know that... Uh, Docker image tags are, you can change them, just like you can point a git tag to something else. Um, image signing helps us ensure that that link is maintained. Um, we may also choose to do some security testing or other kind of testing on our images after we've built them with something like GOSS. The application level, um, so sort of AppSec is kind of beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here, but you'll want to have some sort of static and dynamic Analysis of code for some security for, for security flaws of some kind. Um, be aware that if you're going to go down this route, to be to make sure that the solution you choose doesn't have too many false positives. Because what's going to happen if development team gets a pile of like stuff like this in their report? They're going to start ignoring the report, especially if they're all like false positives. Yeah. Um, pipeline controls, secrets management. I would say falls under this. You want to make sure that your secrets are encrypted at rest, never stored anywhere in plain text. Certainly not stored in Git, even in a private repository. That means that your secrets management is only as strong as your organization's Git onboarding and offboarding. How good is that for most of you? I'm not sure. I mean, for most of what we've seen in our career, I don't mean to mean to say for you, but uh, I'm a member of many good organizations, so I, I, that I shouldn't be anymore. Um, we need to be able to eliminate release paralysis so that when we have vulnerabilities, our, like our supply chain is so vast these days, we can't, if we choose to take the approach of whitelisting everything and blocking sources, then we severely limit developer productivity. There's a, there's a, there's a balance to be struck here, but at the very least, um, we need to be able to respond quickly when we know that there's a vulnerability detected. You don't want to be like, okay, we've got this vulnerability, 
but releasing for us is a bit of a pain. It takes us, it takes us a while, sort of stress in the organization. We don't want to do it any more than we have to. You don't want to be in that situation in a cloud-native world with, with the sprawling supply chains that we have. Um, a CI server should be locked down. Um, if we're doing a push-based deployment model, it's going to have all of our secrets in there, our application secrets and our deploy secrets. Um, so we want to have that isolated in its own VPC or, or something like this. Not accessible from the internet outside your organization without a VPN, that kind of thing. Um, if we, and ideally, we don't use a push-based deployment model at all. A pull-based model um, using something like GitOps type, type approach protects our deployment credentials because Jenkins or whatever it is we use doesn't need to have them. So if it's, if it's uh, compromised, there's less that can be found in there. Um, some Linux security features themselves. I said earlier, containers are just processes. I think we all hopefully know this by now, but um, they're special processes indeed. The processes isolated by C groups and namespaces, control groups and namespaces. Um, every workload should have CPU and memory limits. That's what control, give, control groups give us. It means that they can't run away with system resources. Namespaces are the isolation that we have. Mount namespaces, PID namespaces, network namespaces we talked about already. Um, it's uh, poor, poor, poor container runtime configuration and uh, too many system calls and all these things that lead to container breakouts. We can protect a lot against that using, um, using features like man mandatory access control, um, the last point. Uh, discretionary access control, meaning Linux, file system, Linux users and file system permissions. Uh, this is nothing unique to containers. You should lock that down like anything else, especially sockets, especially the Docker socket if you're ever using that. Um, POSIX capabilities. Basically, if you root, all the things that you can do as root can be broken up into all these things called capabilities, and you can individually add and remove them. When we do sudo on our laptop, we get all of them. But when we run containers, with Docker at least, uh, we have a reduced set of that. We probably want to have an even more reduced set of that for most of our simple applications like web apps. We don't need to do much. Um, and then Linux security modules like set comp app armor SE Linux allow us to really fine tune all this stuff, capabilities, um, whitelist system calls, all this kind of stuff. Um, at the cluster level, we have role-based access control, perhaps one of the most important ones. I've mentioned it a few times already. We also have admission controllers. This is, this is one of uh, Kubernetes' greatest features, in my opinion. There's no way to de deploy anything into the Kubernetes without using the API. And in the API, you have these gateways where you can put checks. It's really cool. Um, things like Swarm and it doesn't have anything like this. Um, not, the only, not the only point of difference, of course. Um, I'll talk in the low-hanging fruit about um, something more specific about admission controllers. We also want to make sure that our container runtime configuration is sound, the way we configure our API is sound. Uh, there are ch check tools out there to check those. Um, the last one hopefully doesn't really bear mentioning, but if you install um, if, if you, the way you install Kubernetes means that etcd is on the same host as the master, then it means that if you attack the master via the API or something like that, you can get into what you, basically once you, once you break in there, you've got so much more stuff that you can access, um, such as etcd. It's the most critical piece of information in your whole cluster. It should be, it should be separate. Network, uh, network policy in particular is the biggest one. This diagram here is to represent that. Um, so if, the, if you have this kind of application where you have a front-end API of some, some sort, talking to a back-end API, talking to a database, those green lines are the, one, the, the paths that should be allowed. The front-end uh, shouldn't be allowed to talk to the database. The front-end shouldn't be able to exfiltrate data. So if someone breaks into the front-end, and this is not the case, you don't have a network policy. I just remember saying an example of how an attack might proceed. They look at what's in the container image. They're going to try and pivot to other things. They'll find that database, they'll grab data, they'll send it across the internet. You must have no web policy. Mutual TLS, I think, goes without saying. If we're using something like service mesh, we get cryptographic, work workload, ident cryptographic workload identity, um, which, is a, which is an added thing as well. Um, we get that with service meshes. Um, infrastructure and runtime, I sort of gloss over for uh, being out of scope here, but infrastructure, the standard stuff like firewalls and VPCs. Runtime, we get intrusion detection, and we have various tools that can look for anomal an anomalistic behavior, that kind of thing. All right, so this is a lot of stuff, right? I've just gone through it quite quickly, so I'm not expecting you to be like, cool, got it, I'm just going to make a note of all these things. It is meant as a reference for stuff to go back to, but um, as I was saying in the, in the beginning, security is often quite daunting for many people, and I think it doesn't need to be, because I don't think we often prioritize, like, say, okay, there's all this great stuff you can do, but where should I start? 
All right, so here's where I think you should start. This is, uh, what is it, six, seven, eight, eight things. Eight things. Um, pulled from that previous list. So minimizing container image attack service. Unless your application is shelling out, you don't need a shell. Um, you should use multi-stage builds so that you don't have things like JDK, GCC, whatnot in there. Um, curl wget so that they can pull down their own tools once they get in, netcat, nmap, so they can imagine having nmap in there, well. But um, also things like uh, TCP dump. Um, ideally, even a Linux package manager, because so, they can then just install all their own stuff, right? Um, I recommend distrolists. I mean, there are many ways you can get a good sound starting point, but if I have to give you a recommendation, um, distrolists is a good one. These are base images for various runtimes, like Node, Java, Python, etc., and they don't have a shell in them. They don't have a bunch of these things. Um, you might say, oh, then I can't Docker exec. There are other ways. There are other ways to do that. It's, I don't have time to go into it, really. Role-based access control. Um, hopefully, doesn't, don't really need to go, don't really need to convince you of that. But um, if everyone's using the same credentials, that's bad. If everyone has full access, that's bad. Protecting your, t your team is even part of that. So they could never be accused of something if they didn't have access. Their account credentials didn't appear in the logs when something happened. However, it can be daunting to know where to start to structure your RBAC for your organization. Um, a great starting point is the GKE docs. They're like, they have this page, I'm sure. Other fine cloud providers have a similar thing. But um, they have a great document on like, okay, your security team, your operations team, your development team have, these, have this, this structure. Start there, it's really good. Network policy, as I said on that uh, slide earlier, with the front end, back end, database uh, type application, you don't want, you, if you don't have network policy, once someone breaks into a container, they'll talk to the things that you may not think that they, should, that they that you wonder how they thought of it, right? If you can, it's all about limiting blast radius and having layers of defense uh, defense in depth. Container room vulnerability scanning, as I mentioned earlier, just got to have it, just got to have it of some kind. There are various ones out there, at least use something. The better ones will have fewer false positives, like all sort of scanning tools, right? Eliminate release paralysis. So make sure that you can, if, if, some, if like a vulnerability drops tomorrow and you're like, yes, we're vulnerable, A, you need to know that with scanning, uh, and B, you need to know that you can replace it like that and it's not going to be a stressful operation for you. Make sure that you that you sort that out, you'll never get your supply chain security sorted if you can't respond quickly. Admission, admission controllers, actually nowadays the default set of admission controllers is, uh, that they rec is their recommendation, Kubernetes recommendation, um, and it's a, it's, it's a sound place to start. If you start turning them off, like say pod security policies, um, also node, the node restriction one, which means that if you grab, I think it's called node restriction, the one where if you get a kubelets service account and you talk to the, the API and you get secrets, you can only get the ones for, you, for that node, right? Um, things like that. Um, do you think, run things like kubebench and dockerbench to ensure that your container runtime and your control plane is configured in a sound manner? And use a restricted pod security policy. Uh, as I said, pod security policies is an admission controller. You give it basically a specification of you know, don't let pods run unless they at least have these security features. You might say, okay, yeah, but where do I start? Well, there's this one here, which is from Tim Allclair. It's a, it's a very good place to start. I'll tweet out the link to these slides afterwards so you can follow these links. Um, now, finally, as I said, some tips for improving your organization's security. So it's, 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 you should do all those things, <laughs> um, that, that, and that's where I recommend you start. But um, this whole, I mean, this, this, this talk sort of came out of me thinking about why people are so daunted by security often. Um, and I think it's partly because it's not really made part of all of our jobs. It's not really, it's often thought of later. An application comes close to launch and say, like, oh, we've got to get it checked. And then it, you just get a bunch of no's. <laughs> and, and you should have sort of looked at it earlier. I mean, some, I'm just a bit of a straw man, I know, but uh, often that kind of thing happens, right? So here are some tips, I think, what you can do. Um, build bridges between security and development departments in your organization. In my experience consulting, security teams are generally, uh, they're generally competent, well-meaning, understaffed, and all they can really do is say, please, 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 don't do this, do this, don't do this, and they can't possibly check everything, right? Um, when you go and talk to them, they're delighted because there's someone who's listening. Um, that relationship can be really valuable. So go to them, talk to them, Find ways that you can automate the policies that they care about, the things that they want you to do. 
and then start to build security thinking into the design of your applications. I don't mean that every developer needs to understand all about cryptography and all that kind of stuff, not necessarily, just when you're designing a, a service, for example, do some basic threat modeling to think about, okay, what kind of data is this um, service going to uh, hold and what are the risks if that were to be compromised. Um, as a stretch goal, I've put um, having an admission controller that checks policy using signed metadata, a bit of an advanced one, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good one. So let's go back into the threat modeling for a moment. Um, it's the subject of a whole talk, perhaps, but just very quickly, because I want to give you some simple things to take away. Threat modeling is generally defined with this four-step process in the top here. First of all, what are we building? What data are we owning? Um, how sensitive is it? What would be the impact to the business if that data were compromised? Who might be interested in that data? So which threat actors? And how capable are those threat actors? So we're talking like maybe this is secret government, border security stuff, okay, nation states, terrorists, things like that. We're talking a bit more advanced actors. Script kiddies, okay, maybe we can deal with that. Categorize them and put them in a table. Um, what could go wrong? So when you look at a service, what kind of attacks could be made? It's like imagining all possible things, right? But there are some processes out there, such as Stride, um, will help you to enumerate various attacks that could be made. There's the OWASP top 10. Go through each of these and think, okay, what, what if this were to happen, and could it happen with our system? Uh, CWB is another similar one. Um, attack trees are a great tool where you can sort of start to draw a diagram of if they do this and this, then they can do this, but then with that and that, they can do this, that kind of thing. Um, it's a really nice visual tool. Um, once we've written all that up, we can say, what can we do about each of these um, vulner uh, not vulnerabilities, for each of these threats? Uh, we could either avoid them, work around them in some way, mitigate them, fix them, accept the risk, be like, okay, it might happen, but it's unlikely, but we'll just note it, accept the risk, and uh, sort of generally what happens, right? <laughs> um, and uh, transfer, meaning a disclaimer or insurance or these kind of things, right? capture this. This is not necessarily for every development team to decide for themselves. In fact, I'm sure it isn't. But um, it's a process that should be engaged with the wider, wider group. And then kind of uh, socialize that, take it, take it around to the team. They'll be like, oh, you forgot this whole stuff section. Or um, I think you're over-focused over on this. You forgot, basically, you forget stuff, right? Um, and you include their feedback, and you go around again. And it doesn't need to be very formal. There is a bunch of formal diagrams and tables and things, like data flow diagrams. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, really. Just do it. Just do it. Do something. Talk about it. Make notes. That's something. Put it into the design documentation for your services. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So security shouldn't be daunting, but it can be. I know there's a lot of stuff, but these are my low-hanging fruit for security. At least uh, start there before you go back and dig into some of the rest that are, all, that are in the slides. And to, to improve security in your organization, make it part of everyone's job by making it part of the design, design process and capturing it in your documentation. Thank you very much.